Welcome to the Lighthouse, everybody. So nice to see all you guys coming out tonight to welcome all the way from Aaron's truck. We can have a round of applause. For many people that know him, Blazer Brody has been like an incredible Lighthouse Project guest for many, many years. Uh, coming here as the uh, translator of the Garner Muna series and obviously having him speak many times before. Um, I myself, as long, as long as many, many people throughout the world, have been very big fans of you. Um, you've given us a tremendous amount of chizuk and inspiration and amuna, which is one of your main missions in life to continue to spread that. And uh, now you're on a new, new task in life, you know, doing your own derek in an incredible way. And uh, we've given you released right now this new book, Divine Direction. We are actually, I don't know if everybody here has one already, but the Lighthouse is actually giving out. We don't have one. We're going to leave some in the front. You're more than welcome to take an extra one. This is on the house and us. So feel free to do that. Um, and I just want to say one more important thing. It's more of a Torah concept. Tonight we are, as we know, we're in the, in the middle of the Spirot. And we are counting tonight, Tiferet should be Yisod. And for Kabbalistically reasons, to make it very simple, Yisod is essentially the last filter before it reaches this world, which is the mouth, which is where we are right now, where we receive the Shekhar and the bounty. The, 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 the sphere of Yisod represents the foundation. It's really like everything. Um, all, the, all the emotional sphere that we've been working on every single week, it's finally like come down like in a pipeline to where we are right now. And I just find it really amazing that on a night like tonight, we're in Tiferet. So what is Tiferet? Tiferet is essentially the concept, it's the middle ground. You have Abraham, which is Chesel, you have Itzhak, which is Gabura, and you have Yaakov Avinu, which is the middle ground, which is Tiferet. And Tiferet and Yaakov, Yaakov is Emet. Yaakov is the truth. And on a night like this, we have an incredible Rav, a teacher, a lecturer, a person who speaks the truth. And that is an incredible thing that tonight we are so glad to have you speak tonight those words of Emet that hopefully will continue to inspire us and, and essentially building us on the foundation of where we all need to move in our life. Uh, no pun intended, we need to move to Eretz Yisrael. I said it again. And uh, that includes for me myself. I know you'll talk about it, but um, I just want to thank you for being here. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Lighthouse and such a delight to be in Miami. When I was a farmer, led of Israel, I, my farm, my moshav was in a border settlement. Uh, it's called Miami. Miami, and it's in of, of Miami. So Miami. Tonight's lesson is Miami. We're playing play on words in Hebrew. Who is my nation? Who is my nation? You know how we know who is my nation? Who is part of our tribe? The ones that hold on with the money. Hold on with the moon. We don't quit. Very tenacious. And our sages ask, how can it be? How can it be? The smallest of the nations that chased after since the beginning of time. But what is their secret of survival? What's going on? Emna. Emna. And that is the pure and simple faith in Hashem. Even more basic. What people don't know. And when I has nothing to do with religion, I don't talk about feeling, I don't talk about the laws of holidays. There are plenty of rabbis who talk about that. But what they don't know, you have a birthright, you have a birthright just like you have a thumb. You know what your thumb is? You have this individual thumbprint, individual thumbprint that nobody else has it but you. For example, you have the state of Florida. If someone doesn't like you and they take your picture and they Photoshop it onto the National Bank of Florida, and when they, the bank was robbed, and go to the police and say, here, I got the bank robbed. And uh, they go, oh, it's inadmissible evidence. Photography in a court of law in Florida is inadmissible evidence because the judges know that they're good photoshoppers. But if somebody finds your fingerprints on the inner vault of a bank in Miami that's been ripped off, you can have a tough time explaining how they got there because nobody can forge your fingerprints. Your fingerprints is the almighty signature that shows you are a unique daughter and a unique son of Hashem. Now, as a unique daughter and a unique son of Hashem, how do you feel when your own daughter 
for your own son, goes away to college, goes away somewhere, and they don't call you. It used to be in the old days, when I, way back when, before I moved to Israel, I moved to Israel the day I graduated from the University of Maryland, but uh, we had sent telegrams to our parents, and you paid so much money for 10 words. The 11th word was much more money. So I said, mom, dad, university, okay, dorm, fine, bye-bye. <laughs> So there's just the kind of communication. But now the kids got text messaging and bad memory ever, every, every, every six-year-old's got a cell phone. So when your child doesn't call you, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Just have to pick up the cell phone right out of the pocket. And you don't, don't even have to dial. We just have to dial numbers. You don't have to dial. Take your finger and swipe it. And mom and dad, that's it. You don't call. One day, they don't call. Second day, they don't call. The third day, you're hiring a private detective. What happens on a dime? The same thing goes with our connection with the Almighty. And we say, that who is our nation? Our nation are the ones that have this individual connection with the Almighty. And that's what we inherit from our great-grandfather Abraham. Our great-grandfather Abraham discovered that there's one and only, one and only, and nobody else, and he's creator and director, the gift that the lighthouse so graciously gave everyone a brand new book. Uh, it's called Divine Direction. And it shows divine direction that the creator is not only creator, it's creator and director. That's divine direction. That's him right now beating each of our hearts. And that's him right now deciding which cell of the sushi is going to go and become part of amino acid to connect to a protein chain to become part of our muscle and which Cell is going to be waste and go on the other side. That's the Almighty making every single decision. It's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. So he cares so much about each one of his beloved children when they don't have a connection to him. You know how you feel about not having a connection with, with your child? It hurts. So that's why we have Emuna. Emuna is our own personal connection to our Father in heaven. Now, what does this do for us? This is in our DNA. Abraham, he discovered it. When Abraham's son, Isaac, what does the Torah say about Isaac? And Yitzchak went out to the field and talked to Hashem. People think that talking to Hashem is some kind of breast liver shtick. No, it's not some breast liver shtick. It started with Abraham and Isaac. Jacob, the same thing. And it's come all the way down by the Baal Shem Tov, and Rabbi Nachman Breslev. And not only that, you find the element of your own communication with the Shem in every one of the, every one of the ethics books, not only in Hasidic, and, and uh, Lithuanian, Sparty, you give me a major ethics work, Hasidic, it all talks about your own personal prayer, with your own words, your daily self-assessment. And... You can see. I'll tell you a story from the Gemara. Up in a Gemara, okay, there's no young people here except the ones in the carriage. Because if this is a lot of things in the Gemara would be our borderline X rated. Okay. Story in Gemara. There was a playboy in the land of Israel. This would track date Avoid Azora, page 17. Israel's biggest playboy back in the time of the Romans. And Israel's biggest playboy was a rich guy. And he went around the Middle East and in Europe, uh, the Mediterranean countries, Italy, France, he yeah, as far as France, but mostly Italy, Greece, Israel, Turkey. And there wasn't a single high class lady of the night, I'd say high class, very high class, that he didn't visit. So he heard that there was one in the Greek islands that she was a step above all the rest. A step above all the rest. So he took a whole suitcase full of gold coins and he sailed to the Greek islands just to go to this young lady. That's what kind of playboy this guy was. We finally made it into the young lady and she calls him. She is on, she's got a 10 story bed, one bed, second bed, third bed, fourth bed. She's on the 10th bed and each bed has silk sheets and gold embroidery and rich, 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 rich. So he finally makes up the top. Okay. And she does something, I can't repeat that. She does something that's not exactly proper. Uh, she had indigestion. 
Okay, she said something proper. And uh, he fell off the 10 story bed. And she looked down at him and she said, just like what I just did, I can't return. What you've been doing, you can't return to your maker. So he said, he receives a chastisement from a woman of the night that says to him, you're Jewish, you can't, you can't go back to your maker, not after what you've done. So he went out in the field. You ever heard the old folk song? Oh, sinner man, where are you going to run to? Oh, sinner man. It's all to, from the, the hoot nanny days. Run to the stars. Stars, won't you hide me? The stars said, I can't hide you. Run to the sun. Sun, don't you hide me? There was a folk song made from this Gemara, famous folk song. You remember Peter, Paul, and Mary? Look at Peter, Paul, and Mary. They sang this folk song. It's based on this Gemara. So he goes out in the field. And he begs. He says, he says, son. Ask mercy for me. And the heavenly throne son answers him at mercy. I need to ask mercy for myself. And the son gives him a, a passage from Isaiah that says that before the end of time, the sun will be, will be concealed. There will be darkness. And then he says to the moon, moon, ask mercy for me. The moon says, ask mercy for you. I need to ask mercy for myself, etc., etc., etc. Finally, he asks all the creations to have mercy for him. They don't help this. He can barely help themselves. He put his hand, he put his head between his knees, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried, till his soul left him. Well, the great rabbi of the generation was Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel says, he cried, and he says, it's too bad. This guy, oh, but when he died, there was a voice came out of heaven, and this guy's name, the playboy's name was Eliezer ben Dordia. So the voice came out of heaven. He made perfect chuva. It was for him a major young kipper. And he did such penitence that his soul was completely clean. So the voice came out of heaven and said, Rabbi Eliezer ben Dordia is now invited to world to come. So it's like, what do they call him? Baseball. Uh, in the park home run. He walks in, walks standing up, standing, walks right in. Walks right in. Who walks right in? So Rabban Gamliel, who was the great generation, great rabbi generation, he heard about this. And he cried. And that's why he cried. He says, there are people that work all their lives to get their place in the next world. And he, in one hour, got a place in the next world. Well, the sages of the Gemara, they interpret that as if Rabban Gamliel was jealous of this playboy that became with such fervent speaking to Hashem and such fervent shuva, such fervent penitence, that he got called a rabbi in one hour. And he had to work all his life hard in learning Torah and refining himself. He said, that's not the explosion goal. I disagree with them. The way I interpret the Gemara is that Rabbi Gamliel is crying. And he said, this is what this guy did in one hour. What about if he had done it all his life? What about if he's done all his life? And then we're talking about he was for one hour, he was clinging to his connection with the Shem. He was clinging to a Muna. He went, turned to all these creations, nothing worked. Nothing worked. So he finally spoke to a Shem until he spilled out his entire soul. This is called in Hebrew, Shtapkuta Nefesh. There's one thing greater than dying on Kiddush Hashem, dedication to Hashem's name. You know what that is? That's living with Kiddush Hashem. Living in sanctification of Hashem's name. We live in sanctification of Hashem's name when we strengthen ourselves in the Muna. People ask me about child education. Education, Rabbi, how do I teach Muna to my kids? What's going on now in this generation? There's so many things with kids off the derech and kids don't want to hear about. It. So you can't educate. There's no such thing as child education. There's parental education. If I ask you to lend me $100 and you don't have $100 in your pocket, you can't lend it to me. So how are you going to teach your child emunah if you don't have it? Okay. People there, they all just they have rituals and, and, and shop. Everything is important. Kashrut is important. Shabbat is important. But young generations, for what? For what? Their friends in school, they eat whatever they want. They go whatever they want. They ride their bikes and play ball on, on Saturday. Before. And for someone who doesn't have emunah, the Torah is limiting. But now you take your munah, take your munah, and you have a normal connection with the Almighty. It comes Yom Shabbat, comes the day of Shabbat, and you get literally 
an extra soul, a divine soul. It's a gift for Shabbat. And a person's connection with Hashem is magnified seven times more. That's a, a great thing about living in Israel. Not that I'm here to advertise living in Israel. But people talk about uh, living in Israel, this, that, Miami. The whole rhythm of living in Israel is different than living in the States. For example, did you ever think about a kosher tomato or a kosher apple? In Israel, this is sabbatical year. It's a sabbatical year. The tomato was grown in the land of Israel during sabbatical year. Can't eat it. It's not kosher. We live a whole different rhythm. We have a connection with the land. The land is alive. And this is what Rashi says, the very first Rashi in the Torah, is that Shem says it, it's my land. Shem decides who I'm giving to. Someone should inform the government of Israel because this is in connection with, with Shvuot. This is what we cling to. We cling to our Amunah. We cling to our Amunah. And our Amunah, there's three aspects of Amunah. There's the people of Israel, and there's the land of Israel, and there's the Torah of Israel. We cling to all three. We think to all three. Uh, can a person say to Ahmed, the Palestini, and he said, Ahmed, no, this is, this is my land. Ahmed says, where is it your land? Oh, no, 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 it's in my land. Ben-Gurion, 1947, waved the Torah. Says, this is our deed to the land of Israel. Okay, if you're a lawyer and you know there's a deed, there's a contract, there's 613 clauses in the contract. If someone doesn't uphold the contract, then the contract is null and void. But then, I don't understand. It's, it's in, like for a, a third grader. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand that. But people don't understand that. So what happens? What does this mean as far as our souls? Me, I me, mean, who is my country? Who is my country? Stop and think. You know what's going on in your soul and your body? I had the privilege before I came to America in the beginning week. Sunday, I was in Sfat. And I gave a lecture in Sfat. I live in the south of Israel, Sfat is way up in the north of Israel, near the Lebanon border. And on the way to Sfat, went to Moron. And because of COVID, and I hadn't been in Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's gravesite since before COVID. It's had the privilege of being there. And going up there, we see Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he teaches us a lesson about. Rabbi Shumai, who, by the way, he wrote the esoteric, he wrote the commentary of esoteric, to, esoteric Torah, the esoteric commentary of the Torah, it's called the Zohar. And it teaches us that our souls are a tiny part of the Almighty. He says this right to be the Zohar. That is mind-boggling. So your emotions come from the soul. When you have a difficulty in emotion, you feel negative emotion. Any negative emotion means that there's a breach in the contact between your soul and Hashem. So when your body feels bad, it needs water, it needs protein, it needs a vitamin. When your soul feels bad, it's because of the weakness in this connection with the Almighty. So talk about the connection. Who is our people and what are we? What do we have to cling to? In spot, went to a very interesting gravesite next to the Ari. The Ari is the father of Kabbalah. His name is Elazar Askari. You sing on Arab Shabbat, you did Nefesh. He wrote this, this famous song. He was also a Kabbalist. He's one of the students in the result. Rabbi Elazar Askari wrote a famous book called Sefer Haredim. Sefer Haredim, those who fear. And in the Sefer Haredim, he writes this the 613 mitzvot of the Torah. And he lists the 613 parts of the body and which mitzvah corresponds to which part of the body. So we know physically, that's what many faith healers, many great rabbis, they can say that it's difficult today because we have many mitzvot that we can't practically perform today since we don't have the Beit HaMikdash, we don't have the Kahani. So we practice them by learning about the mitzvot. We learn about the mitzvot. When we learn about the mitzvot, is it's if we're practicing. So that's why it's important that we learn about the laws of the Beit HaMikdash. We come down to the Beit HaMikdash. But this is so important, even that the parts of the body correspond to the parts of the soul. <laughs> All connected. And proof, ah, Rabbi, you're talking about pie in the sky stuff. I came in to Newark, New Jersey, on a flight from Israel, Monday morning. Monday night, lectured in Flatbush in Brooklyn. 
And then the next night in Long Island, the third night I was in Lakewood, New Jersey. And at Lakewood, New Jersey, went to Lakewood, New Jersey, and I got an urgent call. Some people that get, wherever I go, I can't say no. It's a person, an accident, paraplegia, person in the hospital. We do what we can. It is something, it, what makes my engine go is to put a smile on another human being's face. Uh, this is it's part of Muna because it's son of Hashem that everyone is my brother. You're all daughters of Hashem, you're sons of Hashem. And this is why you think this is loving your neighbor as yourself. I get a call, people know like that. I get a call. Did you hear three weeks ago about the terrorists hitting Lakewood? I'm amazed that so many people don't know. The terrorists, is a new type of terrorism where they have auto ramming. They, they ram people, okay. There's a young guy, Moshe Yigal, is an Israeli guy, married American girl, lives in Lakewood. And he's walking down the street and a terrorist in a car comes behind him. This same terrorist wrote some kind of long manifesto or it's anti-Semitic, it's crazy, crazy. And he didn't, Smashed his bones, only smashed his bones, but he made it into the car, he got lifted up into the air and then fell again, got his bones smashed again. In short, uh, Moshe Eagle is lying in the hospital and he's paralyzed from the waist down and every bone from the shoulder down is, is broken. The guy is in such pain and it is ridiculous. Once he Moshe Eagle and we spoke and he said, Rabbi was on the other side. I said, yeah, that's it. He told me, I said, we had an NDE, near death experience. I said, yeah. I said, I can't even begin to describe. He got tears, but I think strained to talk. He's lucid from the chest up. Next up, his head is lucid. His wife was right there with him. He said, I can't even describe the pain. But when I went over the threshold and saw the white light, these are things that NDE people don't believe in Hashem. You see people in Japan, people in, in uh, South Africa, people all the, the, the an article that had NDEs. It's always the tunnel and the white light, and they don't feel the pain anymore. The pain lifted. And he saw this caressing, loving white light, defies the scripture. He says, not white light, but I don't know how to describe it otherwise. And it just felt so good. I'm going to come back. And then I saw the third holy temple. He says, Rabbi, it's already built. It's ready to come down imminently. It is ready to come down. And my soul just gravitated to that. And it was a door that was to let me enter the temple. And I started to open the door and boom, all of a sudden, Rachel Emanu appeared. Rich, this guy tells us, this is it's on record. Okay, it's Moshe Nugal. This is the guy who was run over in Lakewood. Rachel Imenu says to him, Rachel, or Matriarch Rachel, she says to him, Moshiko, don't open that door. If you open that door and crawl the threshold, you can't come back. And Hashem wants you to come back. You've still got a mission to do here. They came back. And he's down here. And here he is. I said, Moshiko, where did you get? The pain came back. I can't even begin to describe the pain. I know I've had my share in uh, my years in the IDF and we did, I've got my share of broken bones. I walk around with two broken ribs and a broken wrist and protrudes here. And when I look in Miami with my nose looks in New Orleans, <laughs> you know, it, it broken in the same way. And then you come to the okay. Broken bone hurts, it doesn't tickle. Live broken bones, so many broken bones and everything you went through. And the pain, and the, he's not even ready for plastic surgery. He's going to need a, tons of plastic surgery. I give him a blessing. So Hashem should overcome it all above nature. Hashem could do whatever he wants, whatever he does. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says, Ein shum olam. There's no despair in the world. Hashem does whatever he wants. And I believe, I said, Moshe Yigo, you believe with me together that Hashem could get you up out of this bed and heal you? He says, yes, he does. Here is the guy. An indescribable, excruciating pain went through something, who knows, just reliving. Someone goes through a trauma like that. Talk about PTSD. I mean, who knows if he's ever going to have a, 
I, you know, I sleep all the time. Guys go through trauma, if you had a trauma, and they relive the trauma, relive the trauma, relive the trauma. And I blessed him. I said, let him relive his encounter with Rachel Imenu. He says, that's exactly what I'm doing. The guy is clinging to his amuna. Somebody else, if he didn't die of physical pain, if he didn't die from injuries, he'd die of despair. What's the guy you got to look forward to, according to nature? According to nature. But we have nature. There is one real nature, according to Kabbalah, is below the stars. Amuna is above the stars. We are the people that above the stars, we defy nature. We defy nature. There's no natural reason that we should be alive today. One year I was lecturing in London and I met some really brilliant military strategists who want to come to meet me because of all the years I was in IDF and a good unit, we spoke about it. He told me one thing. He said, Rabbi Laser, I have never missed a prediction of a war, the outcome of a war. I said, never write about Israel. When I thought Israel would prevail, they lose. When I thought they'd lose, they prevail. They can't. We are above nature. There's nothing logical. You see, sometimes somebody, you know, you can't understand it. Here's a guy that's got a PhD in, the thing, in engineering, and he's probably going to make a ton of money, and he can't get a job packing groceries. And he got somebody else, some Israeli guy, comes off the boat, and he didn't finish third grade. And he starts doing odd jobs in Miami before you know, before you know it. He's got a fleet of 20 vehicles on the road, people working for him. The guy's rolling in money. It doesn't make sense. There's a guy, no education or something. Our nation does not make sense. Me, I'm me, who are we? We are the nation that doesn't make sense. We are the nation that defies logic. We are the nation that defies reason. There is no logic. There is no reason when it comes to our nation. Why? We cling to Emuna. Now, what happens if we don't cling to Emuna, heaven forbid? Shem says, what do you say? You think it break your head? I had this in, in New York. I just came from New York. One evening in New York, in Long Island, did a seminar for people in their 30s that haven't found their soulmate. They had a singles night, a single night, a Jewish singles night in Long Island. And here people come to me around looking for this one, I'm looking for that one, I'm looking for that one. I said, you know, guys, I, I hear from you all these things, but two elements I didn't hear. And now I can understand why you're not finding your soulmate. If you want to find your soulmate, why do you say your soulmate, not your body mate? Everybody's looking for their body mate. Look for their body mate. The guy wants a girl that she's a size four. The girl wants a guy that's got 21 inch biceps. Okay. You know, he's got he's got in his Gillette aftershave, he's got an SD louder, and got this, that. That's the body mate. But we don't say body mate. We say soul mate for the soul. So what does your soul need? Your soul needs two things. Number one, it needs a mona, and it needs a partner with a good heart. You got a guy or a girl with a good heart, you're home free. I'll tell you a little story about my own kids. My oldest son, my oldest son, he too in the army, he was a very good commando unit. And when he started what we call Shiduchim back home, and he's very well built, nice looking, nice looking boy. Today he's a, he's a rabbi with 10 kids and he makes a living, he learns all day long, he makes a living opening up drains. He's a working as a plumber. This is from a character out of the Baal but when my oldest son went out with the girl, first time, he says, Alpha, give me a pointer. What, what do I do? What do I do? I said, tell you what. Close your eyes for the first two minutes. Imagine you look at something else. Like you're thinking, you know, don't look at her face. Listen to her voice. Listen to her voice. I said, what am I supposed to listen to her? I said, she's talking about I and me and clothes and vacations and money and this and that. Down the road, down the road. If you hear kindness in her voice, you do that too. I had the same advice for my daughter afterward. After, look for the good heart. Well, my son came home and he said, Abba, you saved my life. I listened to this girl and she had nothing between her ears. When I opened up my eyes, she was the most gorgeous thing in the world. 
Mr. Grant, the shop that thought, you know, it's a good looking guy, and this and that, very good looking girl. She was, he says, if I would have looked at her first, that's it. I'd have been, I'd have been and then you've been stuck with the. So what happens? What happens? I get this guy, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful wife and 10 kids. And my daughter-in-law never heard her raise her voice. Okay. Uh, she would win a beauty contest when she was, before she was married. But once she got married, once she got married, all of a sudden she, she turned beautiful. Her heart is so good. Her heart is so good. My son did the same thing. He listened to her. Wow, she's so gorgeous. She was saying, you know, what are your aspirations? What, what are you looking for in a wife? Uh, any you, family together, connecting to a ship? You hear these type of elevated stuff and he spoke to her. Okay. So she was, you know, average looking girl, not, not especially special. So magically, after the wedding, she became gorgeous. She became gorgeous because she's going inside and out. There's nothing, Helena Rubinstein, Estee Lauder, have no makeup <laughs> that can compete with a good heart because a good heart connects the neshama to a shem. What happens when the neshama is connected to a shem? Because a shem is all goodness. A shem is all goodness. If you think of the shem is all goodness, then what's going on with Russia and Ukraine? The answer to that too. It's all goodness. It's all goodness. When you can have a good heart and you connect to a shem, then your eyes and your forehead give off divine light. And it's divine light. And it makes you attractive. It makes you handsome. It makes you charismatic. And people cling to you. This is not high in the pie Kabbalah. This is basic scripture, Breshi. Right in the beginning, first chapter, it's in the Torah. Cain killed his brother, right? Cain and Abel, they fought, they killed each other. Cain was the first murder in history, all right? Cain killed his brother. There's no human beings left except Adam, Eve, and Cain, because Abel's not there anymore. No pre procreation. Seth, their new son, came later. Okay, so Hashem says to Cain, Son, you're in exile. He says, Hashem, you can't put me in exile. And why not? He says, anyone that finds me will kill me. Who's he talking about? Anyone finds me will kill me. There's nobody else. His father and mother certainly aren't going to kill him. But Cain knew that any animal he encountered would kill him, would destroy him. Why? Because he knew by murdering his brother, he lost his divine illumination. And as soon as he lost his divine illumination, he looked like an animal. Animals cannot stand two-legged animals. Four-legged animals, they can't stand two-legged animals. And that's why a monkey, when he's running through the dry, dry desert, and then running through the jungle, he runs on four. When he's sitting through the trees, that is the truth. Because the other animals, they can't stand two-legged animals. And when people, when animals see a person, have you ever been and go to in, in Manhattan and Grand Central Station or busy train station or busy bus station, 5,000 people there to Stray dog comes in, and the stray dog makes a beeline. Now, all these people go to one particular person and grabs his leg and snarls. Half the time, we'll tell you who that person is. That person said slander about another human being. And when a person says slander about another human being, the half the time calls slander non apparent murder. Because you ruin a person's reputation, maybe ruin a person's income. Has damaged a person. So it's like tantamount to murder. So the person loses his divine aura. The stray dog comes in. He sees an animal. Right away gets angry. And you see that there's lots of stories about the, the little old rabbis. They were pious rabbis and they the dangerous dogs, many dogs that won't bite. They purr like kittens. They, purr, they, they, they just purr. This is the power of divine illumination. Divine illumination that we have when we cling to Hashem, it gives us power, it gives us peace, inner peace, it gives us happiness because when our souls are connected to Hashem, it's like connecting whatever engine you have to a generator and you're getting power all the time, power all the time. So this is how to withstand, what do we do in a turbulent world? What do we do in a turbulent world? How do we go through a turbulent world? You can see what's happening 
even the, the politics and the news and <laughs> mentioned the Ukraine and Russia. Uh, the people would say, okay, we, we don't like to see violence anywhere. But uh, so what's the ship doing? What's the ship doing? Why would you pray? Suppose you're still on the news. I spent a lot of time in Ukraine because my family's from Ukraine. And we used to go to Uman every year before that. I had my, my great-grandparents' gravesite in Yanov to take care of it. Uh, the locals tried to turn it into a potato field. We had to repossess again potato wars with the locals. You get back the family gravesite. But uh, what would you do if you open up the morning paper? And this is what they think the shem. People think, well, they don't want to do the shem, the shem. If there's a shem, why are there wars in the world? If there's a shem, why is there sickness in the world? <laughs> if you want answers, you get answers. But if a person attacked, if there was a shem, I just want to know. You say, shem. Why is there? I want to know. I want to get close to you. Let me get this out of my head. Okay. So what's going on in Ukraine? Suppose you opened up the newspaper today and you saw that the German government in downtown Berlin, they made a new, what's called, the British call it a roundabout. It's a circus, like Piccadilly Circus. When the British say Piccadilly Circus, it's Piccadilly, in America, they say circle. Like uh, in, in, in Washington, D.C., DuPont Circle, famous circle, or this circle. They call it circus in British English. All right. Suppose that in downtown Berlin, they made a roundabout, and they called it the Hitler Circle. And in the middle of the roundabout, they erected a big statue of Adolf Hitler. And he said, because he did so much for the German people, he brought to Germany out of the post <laughs> one poverty, and he made all the industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and made him into a national hero. Do you think the world would stand for that? Would we stand for that? Would you stand for that? You wouldn't stand for that. Before Hitler knew what a Jewish person was in the Ukraine, there was a Cossack by the name of Khmelnytsky, Anybody ever heard that? Study Jewish history? Chmelnitsky. Okay. In Kiev, in downtown Kiev, there's Chmelnitsky Square. There's not a single town in the Ukraine that doesn't have Chmelnitsky Street. There is a city in Ukraine called Chmelnitsky. Chmelnitsky is a national hero. Do you know who Chmelnitsky was? In 1648 and 1649, Chmelnitsky led a pogrom throughout Europe, throughout, basically throughout the Ukraine. Chmelnitsky killed half of Ukrainian Jewry, which is a third of European Jewry. Chmelnitsky. Chmelnitsky today is a Ukrainian national hero. Let's go to the town of Uman, where Rabbi Nachman is buried. In downtown Uman, there is a big statue of a Cossack by the name of Ivan Gunter. The rest of us know who Gunter is? Yeah, you know who Gunter is. Gunter, and this is the reason Rabbi Nachman wanted to be buried in Uman, because Gunter killed 33,000 Jewish men and women. Now, they weren't great Torah scholars, they weren't that, but they promised them, they brought Gunter, brought a bishop, anyone who would bow down to a cross, his life is saved. Not a single man, woman, or child bowed down to a cross. They killed the children in front of the mothers. They killed the mothers in front of the fathers, one by one. Not a single one would refuse, in order to gain their life, would refuse to deny their Judaism to the one God. Not a single one. This Gunther did that. With his two hands, he and his henchmen, they murdered 33,000 Jews. So when Rebbe Nachman was taking a trip from where he originally lived in eastern Ukraine, which is near on the other side of the Deber, we read about that in, in the news all the time. No, from uh, the area of Luhansk. And there's a town called Medvedivka over there. Rabbi Nachman was going across the Dnepr and going to Western Ukraine. And he passed through Uman and he told the driver to stop. And he's, he said to him in Yiddish, Doshmak Ganeden. I smell the smell of Ganeden here because this was the place where 33,000 Jews sacrificed their lives and sanctification of Hashem's name, and not a single one 
buried not a single one who bowed down to the cross, not a single one uh, gave up his gave up his shmai, his belief in, in, in one God, his Judaism. Not a single one. Not a single one. Okay, that's there, the 33,000 heroes. But the Ukrainian people made the one that killed those 33,000 Jews a hero. I think this is where we have to go back to. This was in 1732. Fast forward for 64 to 1732. You don't have to see things that seven years ago, eight years ago, I went in the summer, not in Russia, I went in the summer, it was late, late spring, early summer, and the May, June, right about this time of year, made a trip to the Ukraine to go take care of the family grave site. And I was by myself, traveling by myself. Oh, and this was just the time when like, school came out in Ukraine. And they were teachers, and they were taking their kids on a school trip. And there were these 11, 12-year-old boys. And I'm sitting, I've got a Gamora in my hand. I'm sitting on the bench in Kiev Airport in Borspol. And this one 12-year-old Ukraine kid comes up, and his teachers are right there, and they're all laughing. And he grabs the beard, Zhidishka, Zhidishka. Okay, that's a, a Jew, a Jew, and not a nice word for a Jew. It's it not, not a complimentary word for a Jew. Okay. So what do you do? You see all these people standing around? Okay, Shev, thank you. And nothing to do, just to... The, the Gomorrah and the Obama says, when a big wave comes, put your head down. Uh, I didn't react like the kind of macho because it would be uh, make it not so see. Okay, common. That's uh, a correction of my soul and, and the past. But you can see it. It stayed there. So... We don't know what Hashem's doing, but Hashem knows what he's doing. Hashem knows what he's doing. Now let's fast forward to Babi Yar. Fast forward to Babi Yar, where people again cling to Amuna. And what the Nazis did to them. But there were only about a platoon of Nazis. There were 110 Ukrainian police guards with maybe 12 Nazis. And they rounded up the Jews of Kiev and put him in pits and shot him and put him in pits. This is Bobby Yard. This, we're not talking about, we're talking about World War II. One, two, three, one after the other. They, they, they never changed. Until they, they never changed. So wait a second, maybe there are bills to pay. You can't get away with evil. There's a man to me, you can't get away with evil. And we see when people look, have to, have, have to wake up. We ourselves have to wake up. What well, was COVID? COVID, Hashem says, all right, everybody, you want to talk in the synagogue, you want to slander your neighbors, then what are we going to do? Hashem put masks on our face. Hashem made people sick. Hashem took them out, closed down the synagogues. And Hashem did what the Torah does to a leper, social distancing. But people don't pay attention. People don't pay attention. If you have a connection with Hashem, you see these things, you feel these things. My show on Israel National Radio we used to have uh, the Amuna Hour, and it was together with the anchor woman of the news, Mariana, and we talk about Amuna and the news. You see, Amuna and the news. When you look at the world through eyes of Amuna, things make sense. But they don't make intellectual sense, not logical sense. But through eyes of Amuna, because everything is from Hashem. He alone did, does, and will do. You can learn more about that in our book, 13 Principles of Amuna. Take, people don't know. People know all types of stringencies and all types of laws. You ask them, what did you believe in? The very first principle of Amuna, that Hashem, blessed be his name, he is creator and director of every creation. And he alone did, does, and will do everything. We cling to Hashem. We're happy all the time. We're revived all the time. We have vitality all the time. I talk to extreme about, about a terrorist victim, Moshe Bill, Lakewood, New Jersey, is probably in, in the worst situation that a person still alive can be. And without a monarch, there's little hope for somebody like that. Guys cling to the Muna. And I believe with full and complete belief that one day soon he's going to get out of bed. I mean, I believe that. I believe that. I, I go with the simple belief. I go with simple. And it's not pie in the sky. Hashem enabled me to see this on myself. I came from, I was born in Washington, D.C. I grew up in what Israel when I was 
the day I graduated University of Maryland when I was 21, back in 1970, been there ever since. And my dream was to be a pioneer farmer and a warrior. I did both, I did both. But went through one war, didn't wake up, as this hairy situation. And then in between the two wars, there was other, all types of situations, didn't wake up. And finally, Hashem in 1982 had to bring me to a situation where it was wake up time for laser. <laughs> and I did not know where to turn to because we were in a nasty crossfire and pinned down. And there was no way out, no logical way out, no way, this way, that way, no way. And from deep down inside of me, I called out Hashem. Hashem. Woohoo. So you know what happens when you call Hashem's name? Oh, my beloved daughter, my beloved son, you call me. Hashem does not interfere with our free choice. Hashem does not come uninvited to dinner. You got to invite him. Hashem does not come uninvited to your life. You got to invite him. But as soon as you do, my beloved son, my beloved daughter wants me to take part in his life. That's fine. So I called out to Hashem and I made a promise within myself that if I get out of here, there's Hashem because there ain't no way I'm getting out of here. And if Hashem takes me out of there, then I'm going to do everything to get to know him and to change my life. Okay. And I heard this little voice inside my neshama. It's not something audible, not something that, but I heard my Hebrew name being called Eliezer Afayim. I didn't hear that name. This is my bar mitzvah in the conservative synagogue in Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm going to get you out of here. Well, I thought I had lost it. I thought I'd lost it. I said, one of my fortes in, in the unit, that was one of the, small, one of the smaller guys. The guys were big and strong. I was always a weak boy. My forte was willpower, ready to go, go willpower, desire. Pretty good impression, but now I thought I lost it. Either I lost it or else it's the real deal. It's a 50-50. Okay, either the pressure is taking you over the brink. You no longer have your marbles, you're spacing out, you're loosening, you're doing something. And then the other side says, yes, you very much have your marbles because you've got a lot of pain. I got cut in the eye and hit you in the eye. It's one eye got cut open and I had, I had some comrades that were not in a good shape. Oh, yeah, we're still there. I didn't lose it. Still in reality. And then one thing happened, and one thing happened, and one thing happened, and another. And not only did we get out alive, we completed our mission. I'm here to tell about it. Don't wait till you have Beirut or Mariupol, or 9-11. Don't wait for that week. Right now, with a smile on your face, I want you to do one thing, one thing, one easy thing. Don't have to change your life, and I'm not here to, to, to go kinds of stringencies, bring that. One thing, you owe it to your soul, because you're a son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're daughter of Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. One thing, you owe it. You owe your soul to have your own personal connection with the ship. And to rob your soul of that, that's not fair. So how do you have your own personal connection to a ship? You speak to him. I need a relationship. Relationships start with speech. It's not with speech. It's speech. Anytime there's a difficult relationship in marriage, parent and child, uh, with a, a boss and employee, you go to any relationship specialist, any counselor, it's, it's first thing has communication. So if a person doesn't feel good, people have stress, anxiety, right and left. You got stress and anxiety, you know where that comes from? That's your emotions. Your emotions come from the soul. Your soul comes from the body part of Hashem. You got a weak connection with the Shem. It's like when you have a weak connection you're right with the telephone, then it, it stammers and stutters. And you don't have to see, say, uh, I can't hear you. I got to go get, get a better connection. So when we have stress in our lives, we all have stress in our lives, but when we feel the stress in our lives, it's a weak connection. And that's easy to prove. Two guys are walking down the street. One guy's walking down South Miami. Okay, he's walking down South Miami or, or West Miami. No, no, we're not in good neighborhood in West Miami. 
and he gets mugged. And he gets stabbed in the abdomen. And they take him to Miami General and they put him in internal war. And he's got nine stitches in his abdomen. He's got a guy lying next to him in the next bed. He's got nine stitches in the abdomen too. But his buddy is smiling and visiting. He's happy and this guy, he doesn't understand. Some gang mugged him, stuck with a knife. Only did they, they stab him with a knife. They took his wallet, his credit cards, and 400 bucks in cash. Sure, why'd you do that to me? Okay. The second guy, he had an emergency appendectomy. The doctor says, boy, are you lucky, my friend. In another 15, 20 minutes, if that appendix was about to explode and your body would be full of toxins and then go flush all the toxins out. They got the appendix out, infected. The guy, okay. So now he's got, if you put them both on a pain meter, they'd have the equivalent amount of pain. But this guy's happy and this guy's not because this guy knows why he's got the nine stitches in the abdomen and he's very happy about it. And this guy doesn't know. Different. So when we have a connection with the Shem, what this gives us, it gives us a spiritual awareness. And we know that Hashem is doing everything for the best. Now, suppose the guy that got mugged would have spoken to Hashem every day. We speak to Hashem, one of the things we do, Hashem, I want to be a better person. Hashem, what did I do wrong? Okay, now if we look, we don't understand what's going on here. This is illogical, why this nice guy, he's a nice guy, and he's got a nice family, and he lives in a nice neighborhood, and he comes to Shula North Miami, and he donates to the synagogue, and he helps people, and he gives to the, to the poor people's fund, does all kinds of good stuff. And then he got mugged. Why? Well, if somebody would open up his heavenly archive, maybe they'd see that he said something nasty about a competitor that wasn't true. And because of what he said nasty about a competitor, it gave the competitor a bad name. Competitor lost a lot of business. Uh, the Gamora in Tractate Nadorium says when a person is in a place of poverty, that's tantamount to death. When a person needs a dollar, puts his hand in his pocket and is empty, that's like a slow death. So, so okay. So a guy rips somebody off of his, whether intentional or not intentional, but uh, helped ruin another person's income, tan him out to death. He deserves a death penalty. So the heavenly court, it's a death penalty. But Hashem is a loving father. Uh, yeah, Reuben in North Miami doesn't deserve that. I'm going to scare him to death, Shem says, but uh, he'll get better. And then maybe he's lying in the hospital bed. He'll, he'll wake up. If he saw that Hashem did a plea bargain on him to save his life and mitigated this stern judgment that the heavenly court was calling him, the heavenly court, it's not like Hashem is merciful. When Hashem judges us, it's all mercy. When the heavenly court does, why, how does our case get to the heavenly court? As soon as we speak about another human being, we get thrown in heavenly court. Why? Because they say, who is A to speak about B? And then they see if A is guilty of the same negative things that he says about B. Uh, beloved brothers and sisters, the Chavetz Chaim tells us so accurately so that none of us can stand that test. So the best way is to wait to Rosh Hashanah we all go in and we're judged together. And we cling to each other. We cling to Hashem. And that's, that's another important thing. Another important element of Muna. You can't fulfill the Torah's requirement of loving your neighbor as yourself if you don't have a Muna and you don't believe that the other person is Hashem's beloved son, the other person is Hashem's beloved daughter. So if you're Hashem's beloved son and you're Hashem's beloved daughter, then the other person is your brother and sister. You don't need a degree in genealogy to know that. So the thing is, I don't want to I can continue. There's so much I want to give you in, in Miami for 16 hours. Tomorrow morning, we're only going to be at the airport 4.30 to get to Mexico City. But so much I want to give you. The one thing I want to do, usually when I go somewhere and afterwards, People send me a lot of emails. I'm on the run. I don't have time to answer emails. So what we're going to do now, first of all, I want to give you a blessing. Uh, before I give you a blessing for everyone, each one of you individually, uh, anyone wants to ask a question about anything we spoke about tonight, 
anything you more not, anything part of your spiritual phase of your life, advice, feel free now and be happy to answer. Okay. So first off, I want to bless the wonderful community. You guys are wonderful. Lots of light. Lots of light. I was getting some tan. Speaking to you. Well, Hashem, Hashem should bless you all with the best of health. Everyone should have a wonderful income. Those that need their soulmates should get their soulmates. Those that need children should have children. Those that need good children have good children. Give your heart's wishes for the very, very best. And Hashem should help. We should get lots of wedding invitations from Miami this year. Lots of wind uh, invitations, Kiddush invitations. We can hear good news from all of you. And together, may Hashem take the lighthouse and his wonderful head, Michael Ben Melech. Michael's around there. Okay. Michael. Michael. He's hiding. hiding. He's hiding. That's what he said. Give it blessings. Michael's got to hear. Michael Hashem should give after we gave personal blessing bless for everybody. Michael Ben Melech made this happen. Thank you, going to go all together. We're going to Anissa. Hashem should take my, the Ben Melech family and the lighthouse and the community, uplift it on the wings of eagles and set it down in the land of Israel together with Hashem. <laughs> Amen. 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 Who would like to ask a question? Go ahead, David. So, Chalosov comes down that Shem created a world which is very good, not just good, but very good. As we told the told me, uh, we say the first bracha, the shock is, is that Yotzer or Rei Chashef, a session of a cold, a cold meaning that he created Ra as well. So, was his original intention to create Ra in the world from the balance so we could use a hero to be closer to him? Or some tension originally that we should always use it, and uh, we kind of messed it up with the. With the Both Rashi and the Ramchal answer that. First, so Rashi says that Hashem creates the darkness, it's evil, so that the light will be apparent. You cannot see at noon in Miami, out in the sun, you can't see a flashlight. But in the darkness, you can see a flashlight. Because the flashlight is null and void out in the sun. So we see that the darkness makes the light more apparent. The evil, well, the, the evil people will make the good people stand out even more. Okay. That's, that's the first explanation. And the second part of the question was... Uh, the, question, the question was, was the original intent to only to have good and that man by according to Kabbalah, thank you, my according to Kabbalah, now, okay, according to Kabbalah, that was original intention, but then there was original sin and original intention. But even though the Hashem knew what was going to happen, the Ramchal says that to create a physical world and a physical world, this is the good news and the bad news. The good news is from here is only up. The bad news, this is the pits. This is the pits. This is lower the Gehenna. This is lower than purgatory because the purgatory everyone knows is I create here people. Die. So in order to maintain a context of free choice, the Ramchal says in his book Way of Hashem, Der Hashem, first chapter, he says that Hashem must maintain a perfect balance of good and evil because if not good and evil, you don't get rewarded. You're doing good. There's no context of reward and punishment if it's not perfect free choice. So if you're coerced 5149 to do good or 5149 to do evil, you don't deserve penalty. If you're coerced to do good, you don't deserve a uh, reward. So the Ramchal says in order to have this context of word punishment, Hashem had to create the evil. Yes. In the times of Moshiach, where we lose our freedom of choice, that's my first question. The second one is what's the rectification for having spoken in Shinara? Okay, first question is when Mashiach comes, we still have free choice. It will be a free choice today is a 300 watt bulb. It's going to be a 20 watt bulb when Mashiach comes because things are going to be so apparent, so clear. Isaiah the prophet says, that the whole world is filled with spiritual awareness. Okay. And it's now, if spirituality were a stock market, 
I say invest today, Namuna. After Michelle comes, it's going to be a lousy investment. It's got to be worth much. Okay. Because everybody's bad. But, but those that attain the Amuna today, when everybody's telling you all the media and all the political correctness and all the social convention telling you no Hashem, no Hashem, heaven forbid, no Hashem, and you go and you cling to Hashem, then what's going to be is after Mashiach comes, you're going to have uh, 10,000 girls learning for you, you're going to be lecturing in Amuna. Uh, so it's a really like whole thing. You're going to be in the vanguard of Mashiach. Because so afterward, when Mashiach comes, the nations of the world, they're going to do the work for you. And you'll have, and it's going to be a little bug on. You're going to have 70 servants in your kitchen doing everything you need because you've got to be out lecturing. As you, you before, way before, when this, when the time was started, oh, I said, you, you are learning Amuna in Miami. Okay, she's, that's it. Now, now it's where it really comes. The people knew the power and the reward of learning Amuna, Amuna's lessons around that they'd be jammed. Okay, so that's that. What was your second question? About the hair, or what is the rectification for Lashonara? Like, that's already spoken. Okay, rectification for Lashonara. Uh, even though there are sometimes <laughs> they says there is no rectification of Lashonara, the first person has to do two things. Especially now, it is really hard to rectify with social media because, boom, one hit of the button and... Uh, you know, on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, get thousands of people. And the more popular you are, the more followers you have, and the more connections you have. And if you say something not complimentary about somebody, it's over the fence. So now go and find everybody and, and correct it. What you want to do, what a person wants to do is, uh, not you because you don't speak Loshanara, okay? What a person wants to do is that is correct himself when he's Speaking to Hashem, we cannot promise Hashem, Hashem, I'm not going to do this anymore because it's such a difficult Yetzirah, such a difficult evaluation. Hashem, help me. Help me that my speech should be awesome. Number one. And number two, a guaranteed rectification for any, any evil speech is like when you have a little class and get together a learning session with, with, other, with other people and you learn the laws of Lashon and that, that is, uh, that's called in Hebrew, Shuvah the Mishkal, equivalent Shuvah, just as a person transgressed in front of other people and a person corrects other people, corrects other people. And that, that does it. That's a good cleansing. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, I know you have a background also in health. And I wanted to ask you in terms of physical health, what are things that you do to maintain a physically healthy uh, Okay, okay, good question. If people don't, um, maybe, I don't know, the, the, maybe one of the only Orthodox rabbis in the world that's a certified fitness trainer and health coach and nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, one of the things you want to do, can I have a phone Of course, of course. Okay. One of the things you want to do First of all, you can see the Rambam from the teachings of Maimonides. And I have often arguments with issues with rabbis. See, had rabbis walking around with a big heavy punch. And he may know the Gemara 10 times better than I do it even the Rambam. But how can this particular two chapters of the Rambam, he doesn't learn about health. Okay, one thing I do is a mindset. A mindset, I don't train and eat for the body, I train and eat for the soul, but the body houses the soul. In other words, I don't work on my biceps. I don't work on my quads. I don't work on my hamstrings. I work on the sturdiness of my body to be able to take the exertion of what I do to do my job in life, okay? Because thank you, Hashem, I have my birthday this year, and a lot of people don't believe how old I am, especially when they see me in the gym. But uh, I'm 73. Sunday was my birthday. Okay. When you have a Muna, what does the Muna do for you? Stress and anxiety will destroy a person. And Muna, Shem, it's your worry. It's your worry. Don't worry about it. 
Mm -hmm. Your lab. I got to do what I do. I got to teach, got to lecture, got to write books, answer people's letters. Stress, work, want to do that? Hashem, I got to be at the airport at 4.30 in the morning. I got to catch a plane in Mexico City. You're worried. Well, what's going to be the bond, the TSA, the oh, suitcase, and the books? And, the... and you know something that makes things so pleasurable? When you don't worry, you don't have anxiety, your body is free. So what you want to do, people think, one of the greatest drugs, I'll give you a good drug you can take, and your body produces by itself, it's called endorphin. You exercise for 10 minutes, your body kicks into endorphin mode. It's feel-good hormones. You come out of the gym, if you didn't pull a muscle, if you work properly, you come out of the gym, you come after an hour walk, the greatest thing in the world for body and soul. Take a walk for an hour or half hour, wherever you can afford. And while you're walking, talk to Shem. Walk and die. The body and the soul, soul and soul, they're having a great time together. And a really good time together. But what you want to do is eat as naturally as possible. After that, anything that the Almighty created is going to be healthy for you. In other words, eat uh, as close to one thing I try to do, eat as natural as possible as close to creation as possible. Uh, at home, I, I'm spoiled because I didn't buy bread. My reps and bakes all bread, spelt or whole wheat, uh, spelt and treat natural. We eat tons of veggies. We don't have, you know what SAD stands for? SAD, S-A-D, Standard American Diet. <laughs> <laughs> Junk food, simple carbos, white sugar, white flour, Chemicals, forget about it. Eat one, two, three, four, five to eat 10,000. And the body doesn't, hey, what do you give them? I don't know what to do with this stuff. The body doesn't know how to process it. Okay. Sick the fruits, sick the veggies. Beautiful state of Florida. You got them, you supply it to all of America. And uh, lots of greens. And plus, with a snack on cucumber sticks, zero calories. And do that and take a walk. Just it's just getting the white sugar and the white flour out of your body, out of your diet. Boom, that's right away, tons of weight. And see people that, that do it. People, you can ask people here that join our Muna. By the way, everybody's invited to our Muna Hour. It's live on Zoom. It's every, every yeah, here in America, it's 1.30 in the afternoon. That's not a real convenient time. But in Europe, it's 7.30 in Israel, it's 8.30 in the evening. And we have people that, uh, Participate in our moon hour. I had a, a lady in Arizona who weighed 330 pounds, not Jewish. The third of the people that join the moon hour, they're not Jewish at all. They're welcome because the moon is for all of humanity. And moon is also the first of the Noahid mitzvah. Okay. This woman, she weighed 330 pounds, and we put her on our moon diet, speaking to Hashem, walking, proper eating, according to Rambam. And she's down about, uh, in a matter of nine months, she's down to 210. And this saved her life. Saved her life, really. This is, and this stuff that works. This is all, it's stuff that really works. When you, when you do what's good for, healthy for the body, for healthy the soul, it's healthy for the body. But people who ask the soul didn't ask you to eat chocolate cake, you know, a little piece of Shabbat, ah, it tastes something special, something sweet. Okay, a little piece, but not uh, you know, during the week on food fests, et cetera, et cetera. You eat so that your body's healthy to do its function on earth, but Hashem sent you down. And Hashem gave you each one of us our own limited function. Just that mindset, and that's already half the ball game. Okay? Any other question? Yeah. Let me just make a broth, okay? Get a problem, flesh and blood through. <laughs> Come closer. There's an echo. About 16 years ago, you spoke in the big sky. Uh, that's kind of the time of the week. the first time that I heard of her speech like that. By the way, yeah, I'm going to push up to talk about everyone. So say it. Um, and I uh, showed yeah, that thank you for that. Uh, I I have two questions. Number one is sometimes if there's the verses in the Torah about the wrath of God, so anger, but you said we go to speech how we all have a part of God from everyone in the world. 
So if they said Turk said potentially that when the matter of an army or a people or a person comes up to us or our information or our kind of work, that that's potentially that okay. Let me let me explain, that's explain that. that. Just Before you go to number two, let's explain that. Awesome question. Awesome question. And don't be afraid to ask me the, the toughest questions that people know the Holocaust. Toughest questions. So what about the wrath of God? What about the wrath of God? It's the loving God that we're talking about the whole lesson. What about the wrath of God? Uh, let me ask you a question. If somebody takes their fingernail and they could fit it into the electric socket and they put their finger in the socket and ooh, they got the jab of uh, electric shock. You say wrath of God? Cause and effect. Wrath of God is what the Torah calls cause and effect. And it's the Torah's, and this is this week's portion, Israel's a week ahead of me. This week's portion, United States. You got your free choice. In Hashem says, if you walk in my ways, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have all the Arab armies surrounding you, and it's going to be 10,001, and you're going to win. And then it gives all these blessings, blessings, you have peace of the land, and the land is let's see every blessing. And then it says, if you don't, then the opposite is going to happen. Okay. You see a picture in the Holocaust, how one German soldier is guarding these three whole cattle cars. I say, what's going on here? One guy, maybe it's like one guy, if you had knocked him and jump on him, maybe. Why? Why, why? What's going on here? It's right in the Torah. It's the exact opposite. So what you have is that where one, one enemy can prevail against a thousand Jews. So what you have is cause and effect. That if you do A, B, and C, you're going to get D, E, and F. You get a blessing. And we have this throughout the Torah. Parsons for A, that we say before Rosh Hashanah. Okay. But this Shem says, behold, I gave you a blessing. I gave you a curse. Shem doesn't want to curse us. Hashem doesn't want to, he didn't want to destroy the temple. But you see, read the prophet Jeremiah, and he says, talking, talking. Look, this is going to happen, you guys. This is going to happen, you guys. Correct yourselves. Clean, clean yourselves up. No, it was, it was fun city and fat city. It's, it's not Hashem's wrath manifests itself like the electric socket. It's a finger in Okay, it's cause and effect. Hashem doesn't want that. And one thing, Hashem suffers more than we do. Hashem does. We, why do we not say on the seventh night of, P of Passover, we don't say Shira, we don't say Son. Hashem says, my creations are being killed and you should be singing songs. We say creations. Who are these creations? Hashem, these are the Egyptians. They murdered us in the hot sun, built in the pyramids for 210 years. So, no, Hashem's creations. So, if Hashem has compassion for these creations, all the more so for everyone else. And then the other question would be more personal. I think that's all the time. So, I think you were mentioning different amazing experiences in life. Uh, and thank God I'm really doing well. And uh, I feel like I'm on a mission right now to be in a position like you are and being able to inspire and enlighten the world. Um, but I, I feel like what I've been doing lately is, well, what's been holding me back for a very long time is, you know, certain desires that I had that, I had, that was holding me back from like, like putting my foot down and just like giving it all up. Uh, I guess that what I've been doing lately, I feel like it's been working, but I want to know where your thoughts are. Is, that whatever I have been doing, and I work hard, I thought maybe more of a current story, but that's more folks I can do right now. But my question is, is that, is it a way of how is it a way to, to continue doing, you know, even if you're doing things that you just don't give it up, God loves you, you love God, and, 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 and uh, just continue doing what you're doing that you need that desire. Don't give that. anything up. But, but uh, to just do the thing that, and that virus Don't virus. give anything up. If you're an artist, if you're a musician, channel it into serving a shim. 
Channel, take your talents. Shem gave you talents. He gave you special talents. Don't throw away your talents. I'm not talking about just talents. I'm talking about things that, that spiritually would be affecting us on an individual level that you know, just like Spiritually, okay, to answer that question, to answer that question, that's why every person needs a spiritual guide, somebody knows you personally, okay, I can only answer that question accurately to sit down and get more into you, and then give you a good answer, but to give you a generic answer on that, it's not fair. <laughs> feel free, feel free, there plenty of people do. So you can feel free. What you want to do first of all, first of all, is uh, you can see laserbeams.com. That's our website, and there is a place to sign up for the newsletter. All the people in the newsletter get a private invitation to our weekly Zoom. That's live. Okay, welcome. Just for the weekly news. If you don't see that live, it's not convenient for you because you're learning or working. We post it the replay next day. So first thing, see our MP3s, MP4s, and have connection. And if you need to, you can always write. You go on the website. I'm not going to give to you. Go on the website. You'll see the contact info, and you're welcome to write. Okay, pleasure. God bless and much success. Okay, one more question. Yeah, one more question, and then I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> Anybody else? Once again, if there's no more questions, what a delight. What a pleasure. Thank you, Hashem, for the privilege of being with you. And